Now let's move on to a few other types of case. So let's talk about third party cases and third party cases can come in two types. You have your non-medical third party case where a family member comes in or a carer comes in to talk about a patient and you have your medical third party case which we'll come on to in a second. So say you get a non-medical third party case, so a relative has come in to talk about a patient for example. There are a few basic things to do early on just to get your bearings right. So where is the actual patient right now? Is there any reason that they haven't come with you today and that you've come alone? Do they actually know that you're here and do they know that you're talking about their medical records or their medical history for example? Have you spoken to them about discussing things in their medical records? And if they say, yes, doctor, of course I have, then think about proof. Have you got it written in writing in the notes or have they got a letter, for example, or do you need to pick up the phone to ask that person if they're happy to discuss their medical records? So it's worth going through those basics about confidentiality early on. What have you discussed with the patient so far? What have you gone through with them? What point are they at in their own journey in terms of their thinking? What do, that, what do they know themselves about their situation? What do they think about their situation? And what have they planned at this point? If they haven't come to see the doctor, what have they planned in terms of how they're managing whatever it is that they've come to talk to you about? So we talk a lot about this double ice concept. When we do our um, CSA courses, one thing we often see is that when people come in and practice third party cases, they often think, well, there's no ice here. The patient's not really here, so I don't need to do an ice. Actually, it's the opposite. We talk about a double ice thing. So you, you've got to understand two minds here. You've got to understand the mind of the person who's come to see you. So the brother or the relative or the carer, you know, what do they think is going on and, and what worries did they have about the situation um, and what did they think that you could do to help. But you've also got to think about the mind of the person who's not there as well. What about your brother? What, what, what did he think was going on? And, and did your brother have any worries about all of this? And you know, what did they think that we could do to help, if anything? So you've got this double ice concept that's really important to think about in a third party case. Of course, we mentioned already, there are going to be confidentiality issues when it comes to third party scenarios. And one of the first things that I see in role plays when I practice with people is the kind of standard disclaimer line that comes in at the beginning of a third party case. So someone comes in, you realize this is not actually the patient, this is their brother, for example. So before the case really has even started, before the patient's even sat down or, or the relative has even sat down, we almost got our disclaimer line in. Just so you know, we can't talk about any information information about the medical records but you can give me any information that you like. Now the concept of that of course is absolutely correct that you can't just go and give information about the records but when you put that line in right at the beginning of a scenario just because the person is a different person to the patient it puts a, a barrier in place it's quite a negative start that I can't give you what you want um, but you can tell me everything you like but it's just that that tone is set. So what we talk about is just be natural, you know, how can we help, really glad that you've come, tell me what's going on, what's on your mind. And if the person, when they ask the first question about the other person's notes, so doctor, when did my brother come in last to see you about this? That's when you put your confidentiality line, look, I'm really sorry, I know it's frustrating and I know you're here to help, but unfortunately I, I can't divulge any information from your brother's medical records. Um, of course, please tell me everything you can, but I just can't tell you anything about his medical background. Now, the confidentiality line, of course, is important, but all I would suggest is wait for the first question about the other person's medical background and then put that confidentiality line in. Don't put it in as a disclaimer, by the way, just so you know, this is how it's going to be. It just puts in an awkward start. And anytime a third party comes to see you, a relative or a carer, you know, for them to have come to actually see you about somebody else means a lot is going on in their mind. So don't forget their needs as well. Yes, it's all easy to talk about the person they've come to talk about and all, everything that's going to go on there. But don't forget the person in front of you. Gosh, this must be really difficult. I can see, you know, this has been a really difficult time for you. You know, thank you so much for coming to see us. You know, how are you coping with this? Is there any support that you think you need for all of this? Again, just a couple of lines about that third party shows that you're thinking globally. You're not just thinking about that one person who they've come to talk about. You're thinking about the whole situation. So let's move on to palpitations. Doctor, um, I'm sure I've got palpitations over the last few weeks and I just wanted to come and see you about it. Mr. X, um, it's really common that we see people with palpitations. When people say palpitations, they can mean lots of different things. Do you mind just explaining what do you mean by palpitations? 
So when you get kind of vague terms like palpitations or dizziness or these kind of things, it's always worth throwing it back to that person very early on. When people say things like palpitations, they can mean different things. Do you mind if we just clarify what do you mean by them? So there's always good to, to do the tap tap, so get them to tap it out on the desk. You can work out is it regular or irregular just by doing that sometimes. Always think about red flags, things that will change your game in a palpitations case. Chest pain history, blackout history, any family history of sudden death, for example, thinking about hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, um, history of breathlessness. These are things that would mean you do something today probably as opposed to doing some things um, on a more routine basis. Look at their drug history. Um, are they taking things like salbutamol inhalers? Um, have they recently reduced beta blockers for whatever reason it might be? Um, this may be the simplest reason why they're getting palpitations. Think about non-cardiac causes as well. So thyroid in particular, hyperthyroidism, fever can lead to palpitations, anemia can lead to palpitations, and then menopause as well. Think about the mind, you know, is a history of anxiety, history of panic attacks, um, is mood low recently, have there been stress levels increasing, all could be linked to palpitations. Think about lifestyle, Mr. X, certain things in our lifestyle can certainly lead to increased risk of palpitations. Can I ask about your caffeine levels? Can I ask about your alcohol levels? Can I ask if you've ever been involved with recreational drugs? Because we know these can, can cause the type of symptoms that you've mentioned. Again, with lifestyle and psychosocial, it's about linking the question to their problem as opposed to a generic question. Investigation-wise, obviously, will determine a little bit by what you do in the data gathering and history, but um, ECGs, of course, sometimes ambulatory, 24-hour ECGs, maybe um, certain blood tests of all that, things like thyroid and looking at things like anemia, and then also cardiovascular risk as well, which we'll come on to a little bit later and might be useful depending on what you think the underlying cause might be. So warfarin, of course, been around for um, a very long time. Noacs are your novel oral anticoagulants, things like apixaban, rivaroxaban, or dagibatran. There's a few others as well. So you may have a bit of a discussion about the pros and cons of both. So let's look at some of these then. So if you start with stroke reduction, then there's a similar benefit between Noacs and warfarin. So there's no increased benefit either way in terms of stroke reduction. If you look at risk of treatment, then Noacs have a lower risk of a hemorrhagic stroke and intracerebral bleeds than with warfarin. So warfarin's got an increased bleeding risk. If you look at monitoring these, of course, warfarin, you need regular INR levels and you've got to have to explain um, how they work and how changes in medications can lead to increased monitoring, etc. Whereas Noacs don't need monitoring. In terms of adherence, NOACs have a very short half-life, so it's really important that the person takes it at the same time every single day because the efficacy drops if you don't take it in that time frame. So, of course, at warfarin, you advise them to take it at the same time every day as well, but with NOACs, it's really, really important. Um, you've, you, you sometimes have to fight pre-existing thoughts, so obviously a lot of people synonymize warfarin with rat poison, and you've got to be open and honest, and you know, they're similar, but in the medication that we're going to give you has got nothing like that in there, so it's about explaining it through to a patient, but sometimes pre-existing thoughts can't be overcome. Um, and then talk about reversibility. So, of course, with warfarin, you can use things like vitamin K to reverse the effect if someone's bleeding, for example, but you'd have to explain it. There's no direct antidote for NOACs in case um, someone has had, a, had too much um, or is bleeding out. So it's really important to, to weigh those pros and cons out. Um, you don't have to usually make a decision there and then. There's a really good, nice patient decision aid to help decide um, which one's most appropriate for that patient. So it's worth um, explaining that and going through some of these in a scenario if it comes up. Let's move on to enuresis then. So a couple of pediatric type situations now. So um, a parent comes in worried about their, their child who's still bedwetting. So reassurance generally is what's needed in most situations. You know, Mrs. X, this is actually really normal. We see it a lot and it's generally considered normal up to around the age of five. Look for presentation triggers. So is there an immediate school trip coming up? Is there a sleepover coming up this weekend? And that's what's triggered um, the parents to come to, to come to ask for help. So try and work out what form of enuresis the child has. You know, Mrs. X, you have what we call, or your child has what we call primary enuresis or secondary enuresis. So primary enuresis is one um, that they've never been dry. So they've been, they've, they've never had a period of dryness. So, but this could be primary enuresis with day symptoms 
or primary enuresis without day symptoms, so just nocturnal. And then it could be secondary as well. So if someone's had a period of dryness for six months and then gone back to having enuresis, that would be termed a secondary enuresis. So it's worth understanding in your own mind where we are and what, what we're trying to deal with first. Ask about levels of fluid intake, how much do they drink, ask about volume of urine, what, how much are they peeing, what's the access like to a toilet at night, if the, if the toilet's the other side of the house, you know, that's different to if the toilet's next door to the child's bedroom, so, so what's the access like, talk about school issues, talk about home issues, um, there could be certain things going on in their child's life that may be impacting them, of course think about safeguarding as well, we'll talk about this a little bit later, um, but the, I think a few slides down, um, Look out for signs of that, which we'll talk about, and screen for impact. You know, impact of any is, is the child feeling guilty for all of this? Has it hit their self esteem, for example? Do, does a child feel helpless? Um, and how's it impacting the parents? You know, in terms of stress levels, waking up in the night three or four times to to, to um, change sheets, for example, cost bed clothes. Um, you know, how's it impacting the parent? Maybe it's impacting them more than the child. Always in the back of your mind, think about a physical cause. It could be really easy just to reassure about any rhesus, but particularly if it's secondary any rhesus or, you know, there's there's things that trigger your mind. You've got to think about, could it be overactive bladder? Could it be diabetes? Could it be a UTI? Could it be chronic constipation? Could there be an underlying neurological disorder? So again, hopefully cues will be there to tell you, but always think about asking some physical symptoms as well, just to make sure we're not um, completely bypassing that side of things. And the management, of course, is going to depend on what's been tried and, and, and all that sort of things. But um, general things may be included like reassurance, if it's appropriate. Um, having a potty by the bed, so access is easier. Um, encouraging pre-sleep urination. Uh, reward systems like star charts can help. Any recent alarms may be useful. Um, there may be requests for desinpressin. That might be the reason someone's come to see you. Doctor, I want des- I've heard it's an amazing drug. I, w- I want my child to have this. So remember, you can use desinpressin short term or long term, and it mimics ADH, antidiuretic hormone. That's what the drug does. So Mrs. X, it reduces the amount of urine that's produced by the body at nighttime, basically. Um, the main thing you worry about is hyponatremia. So that's why we talk about a fluid restriction pattern. So you only allow sips from one hour before taking the medication up to eight hours after taking it. And there's no long-term effects um, so far been found with desinfectant, so people can use it long-term um, and you can reassure that there's nothing found to impact things later on. And remember, you may need to refer as well. So um, enuresis clinics are available, particularly if there's daytime wetting going on, particularly if there's secondary enuresis, or if you're just worried and, and you have any reason to, to, to justify your referral. But always remember, you can use that, utilize that service if needed. Let's move on to GI cancer then, and we'll start with the upper part of the GI system. So people come in with genuine simple symptoms, and we may need to go through these red flags. So again, signposting is very important. Mr. X, symptoms in your food pipe and stomach are very common. I'm just going to ask you a few specific questions to look for a couple of less common um, causes that may be, uh, may be important to rule out. So there are four things, remember, we can do on an urgent two-week basis if we're suspecting upper GI cancer. Number one, a direct referral for an upper GI endoscopy within two weeks. When do we do this? Number one, if a patient has dysphagia. Or number two, if someone is over 55 with weight loss and any one of three things, upper abdominal pain, dyspepsia, or reflux. That's a direct upper GI endoscopy referral. We can also do an urgent two-week referral to a gastroenterologist for an appointment. In two situations, number one, if you examine the patient and you find an upper abdominal mass consistent with stomach cancer, and number two, if someone's aged over 40 with jaundice, thinking about things like pancreatic cancer. Number three, we can arrange an urgent ultrasound scan within two weeks if we examine the patient and we find a mass consistent with an enlarged gallbladder or an enlarged liver. And number four, we can arrange an urgent CT scan directly within two weeks or an ultrasound scan if a CT scan is not available, if someone is over 60 with weight loss and one of these things, abdominal pain, back pain, diarrhea, nausea, vomiting, constipation or new onset diabetes. So urgent direct GI endoscopy, urgent referral to a gastrology appointment, urgent ultrasound scan and an urgent CT scan. It's worth getting those right. And don't forget, with any suspected cancer discussion or referral, 
Don't forget signposting like we've talked about before you ask the symptoms. Don't forget to think about support systems and data gathering. Who is going to be around this person once they leave after you've broken the words that this could be something like a cancer? And then don't forget logistics of two-week referrals. Like who's going to go with them to the endoscopy or the appointment? Um, call us back if you don't hear anything in the next couple of days about an appointment. Open access to us until you get there for any worries or fears that you may have. And just explaining everything until that point that they're seen. Female scenarios with acne are slightly different to male scenarios with acne. You've got to ask a few additional things. So when a female ask about if they're using any current contraception, for example, progesterones can sometimes make acne worse, for example. And um, think about an underlying polycystic ovarian syndrome background. So look at features asking about periods, asking about oily skin, for example. And then ask about plans for pregnancy and contraception needs going forward. Are they in a relationship, for example? Are they looking to become pregnant? Or do they need contraception? This might impact both what you're allowed to give and also options may open in terms of what you can give for management as well. We'll come on to these in a second. Sometimes with acne, it's really important to delve into health beliefs. Some, some people may think that diet makes it worse. They've cut out lots of particular foods, for example. Some people may think it's due to cleanliness. So it's really important to understand any health beliefs that may help you in the second half going forward. And like any other dermatological condition, never underestimate mood, never underestimate anxiety, and always ask about things like confidence, whether it be school, college, work, and even around family. These are often triggers for people to come and present um, as opposed to the actual spots themselves. Then when you examine, look at what are we dealing with? Is it a comedone predominant picture? Are papules forming, pustules forming? Have nodules formed? Has it lead to cysts even? And is there a background of scarring that you can see on examination which may indicate where you go in terms of management? So in terms of that management then, so you're looking to reassure regarding any myths that you may have picked up in the first half, whether it be things like diet and things like cleanliness. Um, we should always be advising, of course, that any treatment that we start today is not going to magically change things overnight. They can take a few months to work, so setting expectations early um, is really important. Some general things, advice pages not to pick spots, advise them not to wash more than twice a day and not to use makeup that is going to probably make their acne worse. Treat things like depression and anxiety as a separate diagnosis. This is a really important point. Often when we practice acne scenarios in our courses, we see people manage the acne and almost presume that if I manage the acne, then the anxiety and the depression will get better. But you can't do that. They have anxiety and depression right now. The acne might take several months to get better. So you've got to almost treat both. And remember right at the beginning, we talked about um, demonstrate as quickly as you can your understanding of all of the issues in the scenario. So this is where you set up your second half really clearly. Look, Miss X, um, clearly there are a couple of things here that we can focus on, a couple of areas that we can really help you with. Number one, of course, is your acne and we can help you there. You've got lots of treatments. We can talk about how we can move forward from your skin point of view. But also I want to help treat your mood because I think it's really led to you feeling quite depressed and I think there are things that we can help from that aspect as well. So treating it as a separate diagnosis is really, really important, not just thinking let's just treat the skin problem and everything else will take care of itself. Remember, any kind of diabetes scenario that you get in the CSA, make sure you rule out the two extremes of medicine, the red flags, your hyper symptoms and your hypo symptoms. Because if you miss these, it doesn't matter how well you treat all the other things like diet, you're going to miss the point of a case. So hyper symptoms, ask about peeing more, drinking more, losing weight, changes in vision, etc. And then ask about hypo symptoms like feeling sweaty, feeling nausea, feeling clammy and feeling drowsy. Again, if you've missed these, then the diabetes case clinically is not going to be done safely. Other things to think about, of course, strong element of psychosocial in diabetes scenarios. Remember, certain things can influence the condition and the condition can influence certain things in their life as well. So Mrs. X, certain things can influence diabetes for sure. Things like smoking, diet, weight and alcohol. Let's have a chat about these things. And then Mrs. X, sometimes diabetes can affect things in our lives as well. So can I ask about whether you drive? Can I ask what job you do? So it's really important to try and get that overall psychosocial picture. Of course, think about complications, retinopathy, therefore you offer an annual retinopathy screen, nephropathy, so you do an annual urine ACR and an annual serum creatinine, 
neuropathy, so you do an annual foot check, looking at both the neurological and the vascular components. There's obviously an increased risk of cardiovascular disease, so you do annual CVD risk assessments, things like lipids, blood pressure, check in smoking, for example. And then obviously it can increase, like any chronic disease, it can increase your risk of depression. So screening for this would be important. Mrs. X, we talk about diabetes quite a lot, but it's important for us to understand what you understand by diabetes, and therefore we can take it from there. Or what do you understand about complications of diabetes? What do you understand about hypoglycemia? What do you understand by the HbA1c? There's so many terms that we use very frequently in diabetes, but understanding a patient's viewpoint is also really important. So in terms of management, we'll be talking about structured group education, which might be relevant in a lot of patients, things like Desmond, for example. Let's focus on some lifestyle changes, talk about all those things that you can adapt, diet, exercise, alcohol, smoking, for example. Mrs. X, we should be aiming for a HbA1c of 48. So most patients, the aim or target HbA1c is 48, unless you have someone who's taken a hypoglycemic drug like sulfonylureas, for example, where your target HbA1c goes up to 53. And Mrs. X, we can talk about lifestyle, but certain medications are often needed in diabetes. So remember four very simple steps for most patients with type 2 diabetes metformin step one unless you can't take it and remember you gradually increase the dose and you monitor renal function as you go along step two is metformin plus one of four options a gliptin pioglitazone a sulfonylurea or an sgl2 things like dapaglifosin step three is triple oral therapy or insulin comes at this point and step four is where you consider things like glp1 analogs like exenatide for example Step one, metformin. Step two, metformin plus one other. Step three, triple therapy or insulin. Step four, things like exenatide come in. But of course, this could be varied from patient to patient. So let's move on to psychiatry then, and we'll start with 61, which is low mood. So remember, if you suspect someone has got depression, then you can consider using the two-question depression screen. This can save you a lot of time. And Mrs. X, in the last month, have you felt down, depressed, or hopeless? Mrs. X, in the last month, have you lost interest in the things that you normally do, i.e. anhedonia? If either of these two questions are positive, then you need to go and do a full depression history. If both are negative, it's probably unlikely this person has depression. What are the other things you need to think about? Sleep, appetite, concentration levels, motivation, feelings of guilt, feelings of worthlessness. These all add to a diagnosis of depression. Red flags, of course, deliberate self-harm, suicidal risk, links with psychosis, potential eating disorders. These are all things that you don't want to miss when it comes to a scenario of low mood. And of course, link things back to psychosocial, like we always talk about. Are there any triggers that may have led to this low mood? Relationship problems, work issues, stresses in life, certain life events. Could it be seasonal, difference between summer and winter, for example? Always think about support system. What support system does this person have that they can turn to if things get worse? For example, family, who lives at home with them? Have they got a good friend circle, for example, who's at work with them? And do they turn to things? And Mr. X, sometimes people feel quite low. They can turn to certain habits to try and help cope. Things like smoking, things like alcohol. Can I check if we do any of those? Again, it's about linking these kind of questions back to that person or to that presentation. So it doesn't just look like a list. Can I check if you smoke? Can I check if you drink? Think about links with dementia when it comes to depression. Think about links with hypothyroidism from a physical point of view as well. And consider depression or low mood in any chronic disease scenario that comes your way. Mrs. X, sometimes when people have had conditions for long periods of time like you have, it can sometimes get them a little bit down. Has this ever been the case with yourself? Again, chronic disease is a really common cause of low mood. And it's worth just highlighting here the three C's of chronic disease that are worth remembering. Number one, C1 is compliance. Check that anyone with a chronic disease, sorry, I'm diverting here. Check that anyone with a chronic disease is compliant with their medication. C number two, check understanding of their condition. Do they actually understand what diabetes is or COPD is or, or, or rheumatoid arthritis is, for example? And C number three is consider depression. So three C's of chronic disease. Compliance, check understanding, consider depression. Sorry, I come back. 
Okay, so back to low mood. Remember, you've got your questionnaires, things like your HAD score or PHQ-9 questionnaire. These are not diagnostic tools. Remember, they're severity markers. So uh, depression is a clinical diagnosis. Um, and then you can use these tools to try and work out how severe it is. Is it mild, moderate, um, to severe to therefore determine how you may treat best. And also it's a good prognostic tool. So you could follow someone up and do another PHQ-9 in a few months time to see if implementations or, or things that you've done have helped. So don't use it as a diagnostic tool, but use it as a severity marker or a prognostic tool. So how would you think about managing a scenario of low mood then? So first, it's a little bit about reassuring. Mrs. X, actually, depression is really, really common. Um, lots and lots of people come to see us with this problem. And a lot of them don't know why. There's no trigger. There's no reason. It's no one's fault. It can just happen. But there's loads of things that we can do to help. So always think about a few key things. Follow up. When are you going to see this person with depression next? That may need to be adjusted depending on um, certain risk factors, for example. Social support, like we said, who they're going to go back to right now? Is there anyone they can go and talk to? Or who's going to talk to them in the middle of the night when they wake up and they feel low? Habits, do they turn to certain things and advising how these things may not help and other things can help and we can help get people's support so they don't need to turn to certain habits like smoking or alcohol, for example. And always think about are there any safeguarding issues as well in the back of your mind in a case of low mood. What do the NICE CKS guidelines say about managing? So for mild depression, we should be thinking about active monitoring, giving them information and reviewing them within two weeks and giving them lots of information about safety netting and when to obviously approach us sooner. Mild to moderate depression, think about low intensity psychological interventions like CBT or computerized CBT. And we should be avoiding the routine use of antidepressants. Not that it can't be used, but it's not the routine first start in mild to moderate. Once it gets to moderate to severe depression, we're thinking about a combination approach, an antidepressant and high-intensity psychological intervention. Moving on to emergency contraception scenarios then. So if someone comes and says, doctor, I need the emergency pill, there's a couple of things to think about straight away. Could they be pregnant already? So it could be really easy to jump into the process of working out what, what might suit you and which is the best um, type, for example. But ask about last menstrual period. Ask about whether they have done a pregnancy test or if they need to. If there's a delayed period, should we be doing one first? Any doubt, check if they're pregnant already. Um, and then there's a few other things to talk about. So obviously a partner history like we talked about earlier on. Um, check for any doubts about consensuality. If in doubt, ask about any risks here because you don't want them to come out a little bit later on. Maybe again, this is an opportunity to discuss long-term contraception. If they need emergency contraception because they've missed pills, for example, could you talk about more longer-term forms going forward? And don't forget that STIRS has that common triad. Remember, they've come in to talk about contraception. Um, check they're not pregnant right now. And don't forget STIRS. So those three things always go together. Um, Ms. X, we've got three options for emergency contraception. Remember, you've got those three choices, levonorgestrel, 1.5 milligram stat, ulipristal, 30 milligram stat, and your copper IUD coil. Remember, your levonel or levonorgestrel is licensed up to 72 hours. Your ulipristal or LA1 is licensed up to 120 hours. And your copper IUD coil can also be used up to 120 hours. And by numbers, the most effective method is your copper IUD coil. There are a couple of places where you can get this for free, just so you know for the future. Obviously, come to the GP surgery, but sexual health clinics, young people clinics, and some chemists can give it for free as well. You remember, it's always important to remember there's um, you, we should be advising that this is no this is not a hundred percent. Even though we do everything by the book correctly, it's still not a hundred percent. There's still a risk that this might not work and you can become pregnant. And it's also important to advise patients, especially if they're doing Levonel or um, LA1, that the quicker they take this tablet, the better. Sometimes patients or in role play scenarios will have to prompt, oh, so doctor, I'll take it tomorrow then, right? And then we say, oh, no, 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 by the way, it's better if you take it earlier. If you can bring these things in yourself, then it shows you ahead of the game. Also, similarly with 100%, some people will say in a role play scenario, oh, so that means if I take it, that's it then, isn't it, doctor? I'll be fine. Oh, no, no, there's actually a small chance it might not work. Again, if you can bring these things in yourself first, then it just looks like you've thought things through a little bit better. I mean, there's a couple of things. Let's talk about levonorgestrel now because that's probably the commonest one that we prescribe. But there's a couple of things to mention when we prescribe this medication, levonorgestrel. Remember, vomiting in two hours, they need to take another medication. If there's anything unusual about their next period, they should be doing a pregnancy test. And if there's any abdominal pain, they should be seeing a doctor with risks of ectopics and things moving forward. 
So moving down the upper limb then, moving into the arm and then into the wrist. So again, with any joint pain, think about joint injury, think about joint overuse, think about those symptoms, pain, stiffness, swelling, clicking, neurological symptoms and infection. And again, functionality, you know, are they right-handed? Are they left-handed? Is it affecting their grip? Is it impacting their job? Is it impacting driving and things like leisure? Again, that could be the, the key trigger for coming in. With any uh, examination of, of joints, always think about those basics, look, feel, move, and special tests. Um, and then look at the joint above and of course look at the joint below as well. So a couple of common conditions that, we, that may come across in these type of exams, tennis elbow or lateral epicondylitis, um, golfer's elbow of course being medial epicondylitis. And this is actually a really common condition that we see where people get pain on the outer part of the elbow, usually due to overuse. Talk about rest, talk about regular breaks. And bring in things like non steroidal anti-inflammatories, paracetamol, usually first line, um, as long as there's no contraindications, of course. And then if it persists, you've got options like physiotherapy, um, steroid injections, um, and things like orthoses as well. Particularly if there's a functional problem, orthoses may be more useful than, say, extra painkillers. So worth um, thinking about all those things. And with carpal tunnel syndrome, of course, um, this is actually another very common condition. We're getting compression of the, the nerve called the median nerve that runs um, through that carpal tunnel in your wrist and this can lead to pain, tingling um, and problems with grip which is exactly what you're describing um, to me right now. So you've got those two bedside tests, Phelan's and Tinnels. Remember Phelan's is the inverse prayer sign which recreates the pain and tingling. Tinnels or your tap um, test where you tap over the carpal um, tunnel area and it can recreate symptoms. Doctor, why have I got carpal tunnel syndrome? What have I done wrong? And remember, a lot of times we don't know why, but there are a lot of associations. You have that classic mnemonic, ID cramps, idiopathic diabetes, Cushing's disease, rheumatoid arthritis, um, acromegaly, amyloidosis, myxedema or hypothyroidism, um, pill or pregnancy, um, and sarcoidosis as well. Nerve conduction studies generally are the gold standard to diagnose carpal tunnel syndrome. And management is going to be tailored according to symptoms and, and, and how it's impacting. But generally, the three S's are where you may start splints, steroid injections, or things like decompression surgery, um, depending on patient choice um, and what may suit them best. So moving into the lower limb then, so we'll start at the top with the hips and the knees. So again, think about functionality. Think about all symptoms, of course, like we talked about, but think about functionality. Is it impacting walking? Is it impacting them going up and down stairs at home, for example? Is it impacting their driving? Is it impacting them getting dressed? And of course, is it impacting hobbies if they're a keen runner or something like that? Then this is going to be a big deal for them. Okay, moving on to the person who comes in with multiple agendas. They walk in, they've got a checklist. Doctor, these are the 15 things that I want you to sort out. The priority of this case is get your organization right. If you don't organize that case early on, you're going to lose that case because things are going to pop out every 30, 40 seconds. Oh, and this, and this doctor, and what about this doctor? And by the way, this doctor, organize it early. Find out all their expectations, find out at once, find their needs. Mr. X seems like a lot of things are going on in your mind in your life at the moment let's just clarify everything that you're hoping to get through today let's go through it all one by one when they come out with 10 things don't show annoyance show empathy you know wow that that's a lot like it seems like you've been struggling you know with all this stuff recently well done like how do you manage all of this seems like a lot's been going on you know just a bit of empathy rather than the usual reaction that i see in role plays like this which is annoyance sometimes of course prioritize if clinically necessary. I know you've come with a lot of things, Mrs. X, and I'll, tr I'll try and get through all I promise, but, but one thing shouts out to me first, and I, and I think first and foremost, we need to look at this uh, now that you've mentioned it. If there's no priority, then go back to them. Don't make it about yourself. You know, again, a lot of things, that I, a lot of times I see people saying, well, you know, I, I, I'm really sorry, but I don't think I'd, I'm going to be able to get through all this today, or I won't be able to cover it all. It'll be really difficult for me to get through all this today. It's not about yourself. It, like Explaining why you can't do it is never going to make the role player happy at that. You've got to explain it in their terms. Make it all about them. Explain why it's important for them that you don't try and do 20 things in 10 minutes. You know, I think, Mr. X, if we try and cover all of these today, realistically, we probably wouldn't be giving you 
the importance that they deserve. So, and you probably won't do any of them fully and correctly. So why don't we try and maybe focus on a few properly today so they don't cause you a problem going forward. And then maybe let's get this list reduced and then book you in next time to get these next three done. So you're explaining why it's beneficial for them that you're not trying to cover 20 things, not why for you it's impossible. And that can often make a big, big difference as to how interpersonally that case goes, how the rapport is improved, um, and how you can probably cover a lot more than you think you can in a case. But it starts with this. Get everything out on the table, get your priorities right, and then go.